So a spell of rain for Scotland, Northern Ireland during the morning before it then pushes into Northern England and it does clear during the afternoon from Scotland and Northern Ireland with uh, sunny spells and blustery showers replacing it. It stays cloudy, roasty dry, but with a few spots of rain here and there in the south and 12 to 13 Celsius, a degree or so down compared to today. Here's that area of rain then coming south on Saturday night. It fizzles out somewhat, so not much rain on it, but it does mark a significant change once we clear that cloud. Brighter skies arrive from the north, sunny spells on Sunday for many places, but some showers around coastal areas, it will also be colder. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Hello and welcome to The Briefing. I'm Arlene Foster and over the next hour we'll cover new lockdowns in Austria and possibly Germany, vaccine passes in Northern Ireland and I'll also ask, did Chinese scientists cover up the origins of the Covid virus? But first, the news. I'm Rhiannon Jones, this is your news at three o'clock. Counter-terrorism police have confirmed that the bomb which exploded outside the Liverpool Women's Hospital on Sunday had been packed with ball bearings. They say it could have caused significant injury or death had it exploded in the way the bomber intended. Detectives are examining the possibility that the motion of the taxi stopping suddenly may have caused the improvised device to detonate prematurely. Police have also spoken to the brother of the bomber, Emad al Swailamin. An investigation is underway following the deaths of two women and two children after a house fire in south-east London. Firefighters managed to pull all four people from the property in Bexley Heath, but they died at the scene. A man who got out before firefighters arrived was taken to hospital. The fire is not thought to be suspicious. A 13-year-old boy is in a critical condition after being shot in the back in Birmingham. 
West Midlands police say it happened in Hockley Circus just before seven last night. His injuries are described as life-changing. Police have asked for anyone with information or dash cam footage to come forward. The UK is banning Hamas, designating it a terrorist organisation. The move brings British policy in line with the EU and the US. The Home Secretary Priti Patel says Hamas has significant terrorist capability. That includes access to extensive and sophisticated weaponry and terrorist training facilities. Supporters of the Palestinian Islamist group could face up to 10 years in prison. A Hamas official has described the decision as biased towards Israel. COVID booster jabs have been added to the travel pass. Millions of people who've had three doses can now prove their status with the NHS app. It means people can visit countries where vaccinations are only valid for a certain amount of time without having to quarantine. Austria will enter a full national lockdown for at least 10 days from Monday. Unvaccinated citizens were told to stay at home last month, but Chancellor Alexander Schallenberg says nationwide restrictions are now needed to try to contain a fourth wave of COVID cases. Students will have to go back to homeschooling, restaurants will close and cultural events will be cancelled. British troops are being deployed to Poland's border with Belarus to help tackle the migrant crisis. A hundred military engineers will provide practical support and work to reinforce the perimeter. Thousands of people have been gathering along the border in freezing temperatures over the last few weeks. The EU has accused Belarus of deliberately creating the crisis, which Minsk denies. A Croatian lorry driver has been jailed for six years for attempting to smuggle cocaine with a street value of £1.6 million into the UK. Predrag Gogic was stopped at Dover's Eastern Docks in May with 20 kilograms of cocaine hidden inside reels of paper. He told officers he planned to take the drugs to Leicester for a payment of €10,000. UK retail sales rose by 8%, 0.8% in October, boosted by early Christmas trading. It ends a five-month run of falling or flat sales. The Office for National Statistics says second-hand items, toys and sports equipment sold particularly well. Maybe some of that second-hand stores as people thinking a little more environmentally about their purchases. There was also solid sales for clothing and footwear. Uh, as people are starting to go out a little more, as the economy continues to open up further. In fact, it's interesting to see that UK football is the highest of any of the major EU economies and higher than the US, which is you know, a really refreshing figure to see at the moment. From next autumn, schools in England will be required to help keep uniform costs down. They'll be instructed to remove unnecessary branded items under new Department for Education guidance. Schools will also have to make sure second-hand uniforms are available. And the Duchess of Cornwall has been making some new friends as she and Prince Charles end their tour of Egypt. Camilla was in her element as she visited a sanctuary for injured horses and donkeys in Cairo, originally founded in the 1930s to help Britain's war horses. And I'll be back with the latest headlines in half an hour. Now let's return to the briefing with Arlene Foster. Hello and welcome to The Briefing, your afternoon fix of all the latest political news, debate and analysis. I'm Arlene Foster and here's what's coming up over the next hour. Vaccine passes are to be rolled out in Northern Ireland. I'll bring you the latest and find out how businesses will cope. Austria is to go even further, rolling out so-called compulsory vaccines. What on earth does this mean and how will it be enforced? We'll try and find out. And child marriage looks set to be banned in England and Wales, with Parliament voting to outlaw the practice and criminalise parents today. I'll talk to the MP behind the new law. Give me your political briefing this afternoon. Send in your views and opinions by emailing gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews. So first up today, Northern Ireland will roll out a system of vaccine passes just like Wales, Scotland and indeed the Republic of Ireland. Anyone in my part of the United Kingdom will be required to show their papers before entering hospitality venues 
and going about their everyday business. So why is Northern Ireland pursuing this policy when England isn't? And what will it mean for struggling pubs, cafes and venues? To discuss this further, we can now go live to GB News Northern Ireland reporter Doogie Beatty. Doogie, you're very welcome to the show. Perhaps you could give us an update on what the Northern Ireland executive actually decided yesterday. Well, I'm standing here at Stormont Estate in front of Castle Buildings, where the Department of Health is. Just a few moments ago, uh, the Chief Medical Officer gave us a press conference and he said that these COVID vaccine passports were to save hospitality in Northern Ireland. The executive, of course, yesterday put it in law on, on the 13th of December that they, you would have to have this passport to get in and out of um, areas where you're having food, hospitality and so forth. And... To be honest, I've spoke to a lot of the hospitality industry and they are not at all happy with what's going on in Northern Ireland and mainly who's going to pay for it. That's the main problem. And they've also said to me to have a national health service, it has to be paid for by business somewhere along the line. They refer to the Republic of Ireland and Scotland and how it actually has just reduced footfall by about 20%, but it hasn't actually uh, took down the, vaccine or the, the uh, contamination rate. It's, it's going up. Dougie, and we've uh, heard already, and um, I'll be speaking to Colin Neal of Hospitality Ulster uh, in the next few minutes uh, around this and the impact it's having uh, on his sector. But has anything been said from the Chief Medical Officer, Sir Michael McBride, this afternoon on the efficacy of COVID passports? Because it, a, it appears to me that they've been in place in the Republic of Ireland from July of this year, yet the Republic of Ireland has an even higher uh, virus rate than we have in Northern Ireland. Yes, that's what I was saying, and I asked him that question, and he said he, he returned the answer to me that it was there to protect the hospitality industry. He said it was there to help them, um, and as which I am quite puzzled by that very fact. He's, they're more or less hinting at, at a lockdown. The problem being is that people like my own mother, who doesn't have uh, apps, doesn't download these things, you know, keeps her mask on, keeps her social distance. What you are doing is taking them out of society. You're basically putting them back into lockdown without telling them. And Sir Michael McBride, he didn't have any real big answers for us on those various questions of what those parts of society would actually do. Just to be uh, very brief on this question, I mean, we've heard nothing on the efficacy of vaccine passports. Was there anything about resourcing for the hospitality industry to help them deal with these vaccine passports? Well, this, this is the problem. You're going to have to have people that are actually checking these people coming in. You're talking massive wage bills there. And you're asking, you're asking the hospitality people to, to police what they're doing. It's so wrong. It's, it's the Department of Justice. I have asked the, Depart or the Minister for Health today for a comment. Nobody is coming forward and giving us these comments. What is actually happening is the executive is getting in front of everybody else. They are very much... Uh, putting down laws and not looking at, at everything that comes on the back of that, uh, say as in discrimination for staff. Are the staff going to be vaccinated? Do they have to be vaccinated? Do they have to have passports? Are they lateral flow tests? Where are they coming from? Nobody knows. There doesn't seem to be anything coming out of Stormont in and around this. Well, Dougie, uh, it wouldn't be Friday if I didn't ask you about Brexit, so uh, I'm going to have to ask you about that as well. We've just had a couple of statements through uh, from the EU side, from the UK side, and the DUP have put out a statement as well. What's happening in relation to these protocol talks? Well, I said earlier on, it's a bit like Father Ted. Move along, nothing else to see here. And it is just that at this minute in time. They are talking around the edges. They are not going into the real problems here. And the real, the real problems, we've discussed them every week, is over sovereignty, lawmaking, accountability, uh, taxation. Now, they may do something around pharmaceuticals. I think that may be coming quite quickly, and it'll be there to let the public see it. At least they are getting a little bit of forward motion. But really, the talk from the Taoiseach uh, Miho Martin earlier on was exactly the same statements that was made last week, that the rhetoric had stopped and that, that the language was getting better. But I think with what is happening on the Polish borders and the British troops are being sent there to help reinforce the borders of the EU, people in, in politics here are telling me, ironic, that, that British troops are being sent to strengthen an EU border while the EU are trying to annex part of the UK. It is bizarre. Thanks, Doogie, for joining us this afternoon. It appears to me that all they're doing is uh, 
uh, exhausting the dictionary because we've looked at the uh, press uh, conference statements today and uh, we have some talk about a shift into a result oriented mode, whatever that means. Uh, that's from the European side. From the UK side, we have we're securing a solution based on consensus. And the DUP are talking about both sides need to urgently act. I don't see much urgency, I have to say, coming from either side in that debate. But we're going to move back now to talk to the hospitality industry. So uh, what does this actually mean for businesses in Northern Ireland around the COVID passports? I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by the Chief Executive of Hospitality Ulster, Colin Neal. Colin, really good to have you on the show today. I note that you said that your businesses are already seeing the impact of this decision of the executive yesterday. How so? How are your businesses seeing the impact? Well, I mean, and they set the scene. We did warn the executive that it would reduce footfall, it would up costs. Within uh, the executive over here announced the, the, the decision to impose COVID passports sort of late afternoon. And by the next morning, I was getting receiving lots of texts. What, what, even one of them was just, I've lost £50,000 worth of bookings. Well, I mean, that's an incredible statement for one business. I also note that you had a, an, an email or a text from someone saying that um, this was going to cost their business, which was two small pubs, £90,000. That's an incredible amount of money for a small business, Colin. It really is. And people can, you know, say, oh, where do you get that figure? But you just have to work out, you know, you know £10 an hour, 12 hours a day. You know, that's projection, you know, for the, their year. But remember, this is also going to go right across coffee shops and cafes. You you could argue in the in the pub world, they're used to dealing with people who are intoxicated. They're used to dealing with maybe more aggressive people. But once you get into our own license sector, they're not. Uh, and look, we accept, we made our case to the executive about the issues with COVID passes. We accept that ex the executive decided that these make us safer. They've made that the decision, but what we don't accept is the fact there is no financial support. Scotland has shown a 20% reduction in footfall. You look at the Republic of Ireland, yes, they have them, but they also have an 80% wage subsidy. So they can absorb the loss in trade. And then now we're putting young people, old people in the front line, trying to enforce this. And indeed, I'm having, I spent part of my day talking to people to put together a conflict management course that we can do online for the people that are now going to have to enforce this. Yeah, and I'm sure that is a concern for some of your businesses. You've mentioned um, coffee shops and places that don't normally have to deal with people who become intoxicated or aggressive. But surely that is a worry for the hospitality industry in terms of how do they deal with the conflict if people do become aggressive because they don't have their vaccine passports and they're not prepared to show them. Is that a real concern? I would presume it is for you, Colin, and the industry. It, it, it's probably our biggest worry because we're putting our staff on the front line. You know, we've seen very little enforcement of any other rules around face masks and stuff, but we're expected to do this level of enforcement. And I say, you know, Scotland would have a very similar industry profile to us, and we've been talking to them daily. And they, they, they just call the level of abuse they're taking is in the extreme. Yeah. Uh, it's day and daily and hourly right across. And they only have it in a limited sector. They actually have it in places that would be used to dealing with maybe conflict resolution. Yeah, and I suppose finally, Colin, the one thing, um, and, and we've talked about this many times, you and I, is if something is effective and makes a difference, um, then you can live with it. But um, we've seen vaccine passports in place in the Republic of Ireland since July, uh, and yet their cases are very high. Would you have concerns that the vaccine passports uh, just look as if you're doing something, but actually, from an efficacy point of view, there's no real evidence that they work? Look, we haven't seen the evidence, uh, but look, government are saying this is going to make us safer. And then we have medical people going out and saying, stay away from hospitality, stay away from the Christmas parties. Um, there is a concern in the industry. This is a case of, uh, you know, they tell us it's to keep us open, but is it just because they can't afford to close us and help us that they're leaving us hung out to dry?
Well, Colin, thank you for um, joining me this afternoon. I think this is one that's going to run and run because we haven't had any in, uh, economic impact assessments or equality impact assessments or anything on this. We've just been told that this is to keep us all safe. So I, I have no doubt that we'll be coming back to this issue. But of course, Northern Ireland isn't the only place ramping up winter COVID restrictions. Austria, we learned today, will become the first Western country to impose a full COVID-19 lockdown this winter, as well as bringing in so-called compulsory vaccines. In fact, a number of European countries have started to reimpose limits on activity for the unvaccinated. Neighbouring Germany has warned it may follow Austria causing financial markets uh, to take a wobble today. And Greece uh, is about to ban the unvaccinated from most indoor venues as well, even if they test negative for COVID-19. Uh, joining me now to discuss this is Germany correspondent Thomas Sparrow. Thomas, you're very welcome uh, to the programme. Obviously, you're based in Germany, but you have a good knowledge of what's going on in, in the European continent. Can you Give us any idea what's meant by compulsory vaccination, which Austria has been talking about today. The Chancellor in Austria announced that compulsory vaccination that will start as of February next year. There have been plenty of questions since the announcement specifically on how that will be guaranteed, how that will be controlled. There's discussion also about so-called administrative penalties. So it could be, for example, a financial fine if people don't comply with that compulsory vaccination. The decision to do so is because authorities in Austria realised that other measures to try and get people to accept a vaccination offer had not been particularly successful. Austria had already been for quite some time restricting unvaccinated to take part in certain activities. And although that had seen an increase in the number of vaccinations. It was not enough, on the one hand, to reduce the very high caseload, Austria seeing a really dramatic increase in the number of infections, and it hadn't also prevented Austria from being one of the countries in Western Europe with the lowest vaccination rate, around two-thirds of the population in, in Austria, which compared to other countries in Europe is low. So that's the reason why authorities in that country decided to impose this compulsory vaccination as of February next year. Well, I just, I'm glad you mentioned the vaccination rate because I was looking at some comparative uh, rates across Europe today. And Austria, as you say, is about 65%. Uh, um, Germany's uh, 68%. Uh, France, 69%. So they're all in and around the same. Uh, and actually, the UK are 69% fully vaccinated, I'm talking about. So there's, there does seem to be a, a synergy in relation to fully vaccinated people. But why the difference then uh, in the COVID rates? I mean, what is different in Austria and Germany than here in the UK? Have you any uh, insight into that at all, Thomas? There are certain reasons to explain why Austria, but also why Germany have been particularly affected by that fourth wave of the coronavirus pandemic. One reason is certainly vaccination hesitancy among part of the population. Uh, both Austria and Germany have comparatively low rates of fully vaccinated. And there's also a very evident reluctance among parts of the population, which you can see, for example, in the past few months with people going out to the streets and protesting. It also has to do with the Delta variant, which is particularly contagious, more contagious than the original coronavirus. It also has to do with a certain relaxed restrictions in the last few months. And then there's also something else which has been discussed here, the fact that now in the colder months of the year, people tend to spend more time indoors, which also tends to, to increase the number of infections. In the particular German case, there's an extra element, and that's that Germany has been, since the federal election in September, in a sort of political limbo with a caretaker government, mm. which was not willing to make any long-term decisions, and three parties trying to form a coalition, which had presented their own plans, but were not able to implement them because they were not yet in power. But what we saw this week here in Germany as well is both the German parliament and the federal and regional authorities implementing, or at least announcing, new measures to try and curb this rise in infections, which here in Germany has also been described as extremely dramatic. Well, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I think it is really good to see the comparative analysis across Europe and indeed reflecting that back into the UK again. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Coming up after the break, we will be speaking to Lord Ridley about his book, Viral. But before that, let's take a look at the weather.
It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hi there. Colder weather is on the way, but today at least stays very mild. Cloudy for most, and it stays wet in northern Scotland. The exception being Shetland, away from this weather front, but subject to some very strong winds at first today, those winds easing later, and then this weather front bringing that damp weather to northern Scotland. But elsewhere, closer to high pressure, We've still got this mild but rather cloudy westerly airflow. So a lot of cloud around, but the promise of some breaks in the clouds, some sunshine coming through eastern England into northern England later, northern Ireland, eastern Scotland. And it's a mild day, especially where we get those cloud breaks, temperatures at 13, 14, perhaps even 15 or 16 Celsius there in Aberdeen. Not feeling quite so pleasant where we've got the rain in northern Scotland and staying blustery in Shetland. The rain continues through the evening and overnight in the far north, but further south, we keep the cloud cover. Again, some cloud covering the hills and some spots of rain and drizzle around some western hills and coasts. But on the whole, a dry and relatively mild night, not quite as mild as the last few nights. And that wet weather still with us in the far north of Scotland as we begin Saturday. And it comes south, so a spell of rain for Scotland, Northern Ireland during the morning before it then pushes into Northern England. And it does clear during the afternoon from Scotland and Northern Ireland with uh, sunny spells and blustery showers replacing it. It stays cloudy, roasty dry, but with a few spots of rain here and there in the south. And 12 to 13 Celsius, a degree or so down compared to today. Here's that area of rain then, coming south on Saturday night. It fizzles out somewhat, so not much rain on it, but it does mark a significant change once we clear that cloud. Brighter skies arrive from the north, sunny spells on Sunday for many places, but some showers around coastal areas, it will also be colder. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hi, I'm Alistair Stewart and I really hope that you can join me here on GB News. I've been in this game for 40 years and I've made lots of friends. I try and reflect what they think about the big stories of the day in conversation with me. That's why we call it Alistair Stewart and Friends. And you're a key part of it as well. I always get inundated with emails and messages and texts. And if they're really good, I play them back to you. 12 till 3, every Saturday and Sunday. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Join us for the Political Correction. We're here every Sunday to correct politics and put you, the people, back in charge. We talk about all areas of the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland. 
Our debate goes way beyond the Westminster Village. It's about the real country. It's about your opinion. So please, we want you to tell us what you think. This is The Political Correction. Every Sunday morning from 10 a.m. here on GB News. You're watching GB News Live across the UK, the world and our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We're here for you. Don't forget to join our community by hitting the subscribe button. And download the GB News app so you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you. Email us at gbviews at gbnews.uk. Thanks for being part of the GB News family. Welcome back. As we heard before the break, winter restrictions and lockdowns are looming over much of the European, state, uh, European continent and across three nations of the UK. Indeed, vaccine passports are being rolled out, coupled with uh, inflation rising across the world. Yet British shoppers have still been heading out to the high streets, and new figures show uh, that that is the case. GFK's long-running Consumer Confidence Index, which has just been published today, has shown that consumer confidence crept up uh, in November as shoppers put aside their concerns in the run-up to Black Friday and Christmas. So why is this happening? And is our Christmas shopping going to get more expensive this year? I'm very pleased to be joined by the geopolitical analyst Marco Vincenzino, uh, who has joined me in the studio. Marco, thank you very much for coming in. So I thought we'd start with a global overlook, first of all. What's happening globally in terms of consumer confidence? If we take a step back, we look, 2020 was the year when COVID hit the world like a tsunami. Yeah. 2021 is the year that the world generally turned the tide, by, principally through vaccines. 2022 is going to be the year when the world adapts to new, to new realities, which have been dubbed by some as the new normal. Yeah. What exactly that means, no one knows. And there's a lot of uncertainty surrounding that. And I think the bottom line is that if you look at inflation, it's one of the key elements. Uh, according to some, it's, you, look, you listen to central bankers, they'll say the inflation is short term. Mm. You listen to other leading economists, they have diametrically opposing views. Yeah. So that's a key element is about this question of inflation. And then also you have issues, other issues of uncertainty is about, you know, the future of the workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, and then you have uh, you know, mandatory vaccines like we see in a place like Austria where the government has mandated compulsory vaccines, uh, vaccinations. Whatever that means, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever yeah. that means. And so, and so when you look at all of this and then you take into consideration, going back to your question about consumer confidence, I think right now leading up to the holidays, consumer confidence is quite robust mm. because for many, this is the first Christmas they've had in two years. Yeah. Remember, the Christmas 2020, 2020 was one that many didn't celebrate. They were locked in their houses. So this is the one that's actually experienced it. But the question is, is that when come January, after the holidays, when generally you have the post-holiday blues, mm -hmm. what actually happens? And they have to adapt to those new... Uh, adapt to the new realities, that quote-unquote new normal. Yeah. So when I looked at the figures today, I thought, oh, here's a, a positive story amongst, you know, rising inflation, rising interest rates, possible COVID restrictions again. And then I thought, are people going out earlier to do their Christmas shopping? Is that why we've seen a, a rise in consumer confidence? Yes, I would say so. I mean, what happens, obviously, you have supply chain disruptions, mm. which as a result, the consumers have been encouraged via the media to begin their shopping early. Yeah. And in, in Europe, Western Europe, you see also in the United States, that actually has begun the numbers. People started shopping as early as early to mid-October, mm -hmm. and that will keep going on to ensure that they have the gifts for their loved ones yeah. during the holidays. Yeah. But the, the question is, is that level of consumer confidence, like I was saying before, is what happens in January? Mm. Well, that's what I was going to yeah. say to you, because there's only a, a finite amount of money that a household sure. has, and sure. if they spend it earlier in October and November... What does that mean then for December sales and indeed into January? I think with, with, as we head into the new year, each country, generally speaking, there's a general consensus, I think, that um, you know, there, there will be a level of, um, of, un of uncertainty mm. leading at least the first quarter mm. of 2022. I think as you approach the second quarter, I think that'll be more, there'll be much more certainty in terms of where things are heading. Yeah. Uh, but uh, as you go, it's like you're going up towards the Christmas holiday and then come January, you go down. I think that's 
pretty much is a consensus well, of that. Yeah. But the question is, at what point does it stabilize? Yeah. Well, January is always a quiet month for sure. hospitality sure. And, and things like that. But often people leave their big purchases to January. But I was interested that um, some of the big ticket items are actually being bought now as well. It's not just, you know, retail. It's actually some of the bigger ticket items. Is that something new? I mean, I would say as we... So we, for example, look at the automotive industry. Yeah. Certain times of the year, the automotive industry is lower than others. Mm. But if we look at the supply chain disruptions, the motor in, in the industry, that's impacting the costs. And many in their planning in, within the motor auto industry, mm. for example, if you look at Chevrolet, just one small example, many of the cars that they were constructing with heated seats, they stopped production in certain vehicles and certain models because they don't have the microchips. So as a result of that, that's going to lead to an entire new approach whereby Ford, Chevrolet, uh, they're looking at, they're cutting their own deals directly with the chip makers, and Ford is actually trying to bring that entire process in-house. Yeah. So this is all issues about supply chains, and at what point does this, does this whole uncertainty, when does it end and things stabilize? Well, interestingly, in Northern Ireland, where I'm from, they've decided today to make an announcement that people should work from home if they can. Now, surely that's going to have a, an impact on our town centres and our city centres in terms of retail confidence. Sure. The future of the workplace. Mm. The general consensus, once again, it's going to be a hybrid, yes. quote unquote. What does hybrid mean? Mm. How many days a week? If you're working, say for example, look at Apple. Apple mm. announced it on February. It pushed back its date for everyone to come back to the office. They've pushed it back to February 1st. And I think part of that is they're still trying to question how does this hybrid model, how has it exactly happened? And for and people, for hey, look at taxing, for example. If you want to work remotely, if you're working in a place that has a lower uh, standard of living, lower costs, maybe your salary is going to be changed well, according true. to that. you've got more yeah. disposable income, I suppose, if that's the case. Marco, thank you so much Cheers. for coming in. That's a very interesting uh, debate. So the legal age for getting married uh, in England and Wales has been raised from 16 to 18, uh, and joining me later on will be the uh, MP for that. But first of all, here's your news headlines. Hello, I'm Karen Roberts. Here are the latest headlines. Counterterrorism police have confirmed the bomb which exploded outside the Liverpool Women's Hospital on Sunday had been packed with ball bearings. They say it could have caused significant injury or death had it exploded in the way the bomber intended. An investigation is underway after two women and two children died following a house fire in Bexley Heath in south-east London. The victims were rescued from the first floor but all died at the scene. The fire is not thought to be suspicious. The UK is banning Hamas, designating it as a terrorist organisation. The move brings British policy in line with the EU and the US. The Home Secretary, Priti Patel, says Hamas has significant terrorist capability. A Hamas official has described the decision as biased towards Israel. COVID booster jabs have been added to the travel pass. Millions of people who've had three doses can now prove their status with the NHS app. It means that they'll be able to visit countries where vaccinations are only valid for a certain amount of time without having to quarantine. U.S. President Joe Biden will temporarily transfer power to his deputy as he undergoes a medical procedure. It means that Vice President Kamala Harris will become the first woman in history with presidential power in the U.S. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki told reporters it will only be temporary, while President Biden is under anesthesia for a routine colonoscopy. Well, that's it. We'll have a full update for you at the top of the hour. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. 
This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Welcome back. So did COVID-19 jump to humans from animals or was it pushed by scientists? And what role did the Chinese communist state play in the process and the political cover-up? My next guest has written the first comprehensive mass market book on this very topic. Just this morning, Dr. Michael Warby, an expert in virus evolution at the University of Arizona, however, has claimed to have found the very first COVID patient. According to him, the first known COVID-19 patient patient zero, if you like, was a seafood vendor at a dank Wuhan animal market. So joining me now is Lord Matt Ridley, the author of Viral, the search for the origin uh, of COVID-19. Uh, Lord Ridley, Matt, how do you respond to those claims from Michael Warby today? Well, I was rather surprised to read Michael's paper in Science this morning because um, uh, he says that the uh, an earlier case on December the 8th was not a valid case because the man was basically going to his dentist that day and it wasn't for another week that he got COVID. Well, my sources told me that back in May, so I knew that. Uh, now, he's therefore saying that the next earliest case that we know about for sure from the World Health Organization report on this uh, is a few days later, and that was a, a vendor in the in the market. Well, again, we've known that for months, but nobody thinks that's the first case. Everybody thinks the first case has happened in November. So finding out what happened in December really doesn't add anything. And Dr. Warby goes on to say that uh, the, finding this one person who was selling something in the seafood market, um, and we know that there's no correlation between the sale of wild animals in that market and uh, the, where they found traces of the virus when they searched, um, is strong evidence that it came there in food. But they've tested 80,000 animals in China, including in markets, and they have yet to find a single one that carries SARS-CoV-2. Well, uh, indeed, but you are convinced, Matt, are you not, that um, there is no doubt in your mind that SARS-CoV-2 started in Wuhan. That, that's a given fact. I think the dispute uh, is between whether it came from natural origins, uh, from, from a bat, uh, uh, as opposed to from a lab incident. Um, I mean, yeah. why are you so sure yeah. it, it start, all started in Wuhan? Explain to our viewers. Um, well, I should I should clarify, by the way, that our that the book uh, is a jointly co-authored book with a brilliant scientist called Alina Chan at uh, Harvard and MIT, uh, and she and I have been looking at all the evidence we can in all directions, and we've pushed both the uh, natural spillover hypothesis and the, the lab leak theory as far as we can push it in each case to try and test it, and yes, we cannot find any good evidence for. Um, uh, anybody getting infected in any other city than Wuhan in 2019. Um, that is to say, lots of reports in Italy and other places, none of them quite stack up. It, th th there is very little doubt that, that this uh, outbreak started in Wuhan. But Wuhan is not where the bats that carry these viruses live. Mm. It's more than a thousand miles from there. And the only known link between the area where those bats live 
and Wuhan is that scientists at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, uh, which is the leading global laboratory researching bat-like SARS, bat SARS-like coronaviruses, uh, scientists from that laboratory were traveling routinely to southern China, collecting viruses, bringing them back, analyzing them, manipulating them, engineering them, testing them on um, humanized mice in the laboratory. So uh, until we find better evidence to the contrary, that the possibility that that caused an accident that maybe wasn't even noticed at the time uh, does have to be taken very seriously. But it's not just from China, as I understand it. I was reading your article uh, in The Spectator and you were saying that um, there were samples which had come from bats from eight countries, such as Laos and places like that. Um, uh, and, and you were saying that that is quite important because there was some US funding went into that um, piece of research and therefore maybe there's an opportunity to have a look at some of that data. Do you think that's possible? Yes, this is a very interesting new development that uh, we've known that, that, that bats with similar viruses are also living in other Southeast Asian, Southeast Asian countries. But in uh, last summer, some viruses were found that are very closely related to the, the uh, the virus that causes the pandemic. Not so close that they're, they're the progenitor, but they are at least close cousins. And they were in Laos. And you might think, oh, well, that maybe does imply that it is nothing to do with the scientists. And then we discovered just a few weeks ago that the scientists from Wuhan were involved in collecting viruses from bats in Laos and other countries in Southeast Asia as well. And that any samples collected by US, research, US funded researchers in Southeast Asia were sent for analysis at the Wuhan Institute of Virology and nowhere else. So the, again, it's a connection to that. Now, the fact that that is US funded research outside China means that we now have a better chance to mm. open up what exactly happened, what samples were collected, uh, what information we have on them. I think we're going to be told that because they've gone to Wuhan, it's up to the Chinese state to tell us what's in them. But that's not good enough. If the US taxpayer has funded this research, has found these viruses, then it should have access to the data. Yeah. And, and uh, do you think that's likely? I mean, do you think that there's a possibility that we might get to see that data or the people that need to see the data uh, will be able to see it? Well, uh, Alina Chan and I have had a tremendous struggle to get basic information about this work, even out of US scientists. I mean, just a few weeks ago, we, we found out a very important bit of information that had been withheld by US scientists and was uncovered by a, a leak from a grant proposal to the Pentagon. Uh, so um, uh, the, the lack of transparency, and then there's, a, there's another key uh, inf piece of information we need, which is why a whole bunch of scientists changed their minds about the plausibility of a lab leak after a phone call on the first weekend of February in 2020. Um, we've seen the, uh, 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 the emails about that phone call, and they're wholly redacted. Why is that? I mean, millions of people are dead here. We should, in the West, be fully transparent about what we know. We're not saying we know the answer. We're saying we want to see all sides of this debate properly investigated. And, and who's responsible for redacting those emails? Are the, is that the Chinese state or is it the WHO? Or who's responsible for redacting? Yeah, that's the, that's the US government. Oh, but yeah. uh, U, UK scientists were involved in that uh, conversation too. And uh, the UK versions of the emails have very slightly less redaction in them but not enough to make a difference. Yeah. And you did mention your co-author, Alina Chan. Of course, she is a very well-respected Canadian molecular biologist, uh, but you only recently met her, is my understanding. Uh, so that must have been strange to have written a book with somebody and only to have met them recently. It's an extraordinary thing. I, you know, we started working on the book together about a year ago. We uh, sent drafts backwards and forwards across the Atlantic. And then uh, two weeks ago in, um, well, no, actually it was last week, mm -hmm. uh, I was in Boston and uh, I walked into a restaurant and shook her hand for the first time. <laughs> I don't, I wonder if anyone's ever done that, <laughs> co-authored a book with someone they've never met. Yeah. <laughs> I said to her, I see you're three-dimensional. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. And, and just before you go, I did want to uh, just ask you about the fact that Facebook had tried to censor some of the work that you had been doing in relation to this uh, origin of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, I mean, presumably, uh, given that uh, we live in an age of free speech, allegedly, uh, you would have something to say about the influence of big tech on all of that. 
Yes, it's really shocking, actually, that for the first 18 months of this pandemic, if you wanted to discuss whether or not laboratory research might have played a role in the uh, origin of the virus accidentally, I'm not talking about you know conspiracy theories about bioweapons or anything, then Facebook would simply censor that discussion. The result of that was that the people who were digging quite legally into Chinese websites to try and find information, had to communicate on Twitter, which was the social media that did allow this conversation to take place. And they became an incredibly important part of the story. They dug up lots of useful information that wasn't forthcoming from uh, official sources or from mainstream media. And thank goodness that channel of Twitter communication was possible for these people who are um, are, are these open source analysts who are our main sources for a lot of the information in the book. Um, it's quite scary to think how close we came to not being allowed to talk about this because of the, uh, the policies of certain social media companies. And, and just finally, Matt, can I just ask you, do you think uh, that the fact that um, the, the, the former president, Donald Trump, supported the lab leak theory, do you think that had an influence on some of these big tech giants? Do you think that was why they decided to do what they did? I think there's no doubt about that. The fact that Donald Trump was talking about a, a possible laboratory origin of the virus mm. uh, meant that a lot of people wanted to rule that out to start with, or rather wanted to prevent that discussion happening. And uh, it became a lot easier to talk about after um, uh, the uh, Joe Biden was elected. But interestingly, the Biden administration has continued roughly the same attitude towards this story as the Trump administration. Mm. Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, and Jake Sullivan, the um, uh, National Security Advisor, have both said that we do need to investigate the laboratory origin possibilities. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, well, Matt, thank you so much for joining us and, and for talking us through uh, what is a very complicated uh, piece, but I think you've done very well in explaining it to our viewers today. So the book Viral, The Search for the Origin of COVID-19, uh, is out now uh, for those of you who would like to see it in more detail. Thank you, Matt. So we've just heard in our bulletin, actually, when we're talking about the Joe Biden administration, that uh, Kamala Harris, the vice president, has taken on executive authority so that Joe Biden can go under anaesthetic. So just making that point, because, of course, that will definitely become a table quiz question in the future. Uh, when did the first woman take on executive power uh, in the United States of America, albeit only, uh, we think, for a very short period of time? But moving on then, the legal age to marry in England and Wales will be raised from 16 to 18. Just hours ago, the bill put forward uh, by the Tory MP Pauline Latham passed its second reading and has now gone to committee stage. The new law will ban 16 and 17-year-olds from getting married, even with parental consent. And it also makes it illegal to push or facilitate an illegal child marriage. Delighted that Pauline uh, is joining me now to discuss her bill. Uh, and the fact that she had that uh, second reading uh, just this morning. Uh, Pauline, you're very welcome uh, to the show. Why did you decide to put this forward? Well, I sit on the International Development Select Committee in Parliament, and we go around the world talking to different countries, usually developing countries, where they still have child marriage. But actually, we are telling them, don't get married until you're 18. But they come back and say, well, of course, that's OK, but you allow it. So it seems to me that if we're telling other people what to do, we should put our own house in order, as well as the fact we've signed two international treaties, including the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, where we're saying that no child should be married as a child and the age of 18 is when they become an adult. So we're just trying to normalise what we've been saying for a very long time. It's about time too. Well, absolutely. And of course, it's not just registered marriages you're dealing with. It's also those uh, perhaps religious marriages that aren't registered as well. I think they're covered as well by the legislation. Am I right about that? Yeah, well, the thing is that this is not just um, people who are re do, going through the civil part of the marriage. It's will also impact those that go through the religious part of the marriage and therefore they will not it will not be legal at all to for them to
be married, no matter whether it's civil or just religious. And that's going to be transformative in this country because many people are married from the religious side, which is seen in the eyes of their community as being legal, even though it isn't actually legal. But we're going to stop that too. Yeah, I think it's important to close off those two uh, elements. And and just for our viewers, Pauline, how many of these marriages would take place in the UK uh, in a year? Well, it's very difficult to tell because if they're not legal marriages that have gone through the civil part of the ceremony, it's impossible to know because they're not registered. Um, We know that there are a couple of hundred um, child marriages with parental consent, but those that are with parental consent that have been conditioned into getting married at 16 or even younger who only go through the religious or cultural side, they're seen as legally married in their community's eyes, but they're not. And therefore, they've never been registered. So it's it's the tip of an iceberg, really. There could be thousands. We just don't know. Yeah. And you've made the comment I was reading uh, earlier on that more often uh, than not, it is used as a mechanism for abuse. What were you thinking of when you were making those comments? Is, is it about the uh, pressure that these young people are put under to get married? Is that what you were thinking of? Well, yes. Some, some of these young people have just been conditioned. They've been taught since the age of three, four, five, that, you know, you're going to marry a, your cousin or a much older man when you're 16 or 14. And they just take it accept it as the parents have told them this is what's going to happen it must be normal and therefore it's only when they understand exactly what a marriage to somebody much usually much older than themselves is all about it's only then that they actually look at it and think i don't think this is right although some people in this country have hoped that somebody would challenge whether it was right or not. I mean, for instance, Paisley Mahmoud, who was married at 16 to somebody of 32, which is so much older, she thought that her teachers might challenge it. She thought that the registrar might say to her, well, are you happy with this? This was going through a legal marriage at age 16. Nobody asked her. So she didn't, she couldn't say to her parents, as as any 16 year old who's totally reliant upon their parents, and you think the parents are doing it in your best interest because that's what parents are supposed to do. She couldn't ask her parents not to go through with it. So it made it an incredibly difficult situation for her. And she did get married at, at 16 and she wanted to carry on into education. She wanted to go to university and, you know, it, it changed her life for the worse, much, much worse. And her own sister was murdered because she left her husband and again the arranged marriage left her much older husband and her family said it brought shame on her on the family and the male members of the family murdered her and that cannot be right i mean this is why it's so serious yeah the the honor killings of course are the unfortunate consequence sometimes uh, of what happens when a young yeah. person wants to leave uh, a marriage that has been arranged in this way and but just thinking yeah. about the communities um, that, that practice these young marriages, has there been much kickback in terms of uh, consultation responses? If you can give me a quick answer, please. No, because all we're doing is we're normalising what... I mean, the age of marriage is 18. Uh, civil partnerships, again, are 16 with parental consent, as any marriage can be. So we're just taking it all up to 80, which is where it should be. Yeah. And it's following international treaties on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so no, I've been quite surprised. Everybody that I've come across has been totally supportive of it. And I hope that will continue because it's, it's well, a Pauline, very different I, I, thing from 100 years ago yeah. when people, it's, it was to stop children getting married under the age of 16. And in 1949, it was to allow marriage between the age of 16 and 18 but you could leave school at 15 you can't now you've got to be in education and training till you're 18 it's a nonsense to have it so that children and they are children Pauline, who cannot make the decision for themselves we'll have to leave it there i'm very sorry to uh, interrupt you but you've been watching the briefing with me uh, arlene foster up next it's nana akua but for now i'll leave you with the weather forecast
It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hi there. Colder weather is on the way, but today at least stays very mild. Cloudy for most, and it stays wet in northern Scotland. The exception being Shetland, away from this weather front, but subject to some very strong winds at first today. Those winds easing later, and then this weather front bringing that damp weather to northern Scotland. But elsewhere, closer to high pressure. We've still got this mild but rather cloudy westerly airflow. So a lot of cloud around, but the promise of some breaks in the clouds, some sunshine coming through eastern England into northern England later, northern Ireland, eastern Scotland. And it's a mild day, especially where we get those cloud breaks, temperatures at 13, 14, perhaps even 15 or 16 Celsius there in Aberdeen. Not feeling quite so pleasant where we've got the rain in northern Scotland and staying blustery in Shetland. The rain continues through the evening and overnight in the far north, but further south, we keep the cloud cover. Again, some cloud covering the hills and some spots of rain and drizzle around some western hills and coasts. But on the whole, a dry and relatively mild night, not quite as mild as the last few nights. And that wet weather still with us in the far north of Scotland as we begin Saturday. And it comes south, so a spell of rain for Scotland, Northern Ireland during the morning before it then pushes into Northern England. And it does clear during the afternoon from Scotland and Northern Ireland with uh, sunny spells and blustery showers replacing it. It stays cloudy, roasty dry, but with a few spots of rain here and there in the south. And 12 to 13 Celsius, a degree or so down compared to today. Here's that area of rain then, coming south on Saturday night. It fizzles out somewhat, so not much rain on it, but it does mark a significant change once we clear that cloud. Brighter skies arrive from the north, sunny spells on Sunday for many places, but some showers around coastal areas, it will also be colder. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Join me, Nana Aquir, on Fridays, Saturdays and Sunday afternoons here on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as my panel and I take on some of the top stories hitting the headlines. You can look up the statistics. No, you look it up. I hug everyone. Oh. Oh. We learn from it and try and yeah. move on. That's it. <laughs> Opinion is at the heart of the show. It's a place for open and frank conversation, but without the fear of cancellation. So join me here on GB News on Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoons between 4 and 6 p.m. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News.
Hello, good afternoon and welcome. I'm Nana Aquir and for the next two hours, me and my panel will be taking on some of the big topics hitting the headlines right now. The show is all about opinion. It's mine, it's theirs and of course it's yours. We'll be debating, discussing and at some times we will disagree but no one will be cancelled. We're also expecting to hear from the Home Secretary Priti Patel as she holds a news conference in Washington. We'll likely hear more about her plans to pres uh, prescribe the Palestinian militant group Hamas as a terrorist organisation. So on my panel today it's writer and commentator John Gaunt and also comedian Abby Roberts. But first, let's get your latest news headlines. Hello, I'm Karen Roberts. This is your news at four o'clock. Counterterrorism police have confirmed that the bomb which exploded outside the Liverpool Women's Hospital on Sunday had been packed with ball bearings. They say it could have caused significant injury or death had it exploded in the way the bomber intended. Detectives are examining the possibility that the motion of the taxi stopping suddenly may have caused the improvised device to detonate prematurely. Police have also spoken to the brother of the bomber. An investigation is underway following the deaths of two women and two children after a house fire in southeast London. Firefighters managed to pull all four people from the property in Bexley Heath, but they died at the scene. A man